Thank you. So I'd like to thank again David Pointcheval and Thomas Johansson for inviting me to speak here. I'd also like to thank Nigel Smart for providing me with three bodyguards, which helped me feel very safe during the conference. So thanks. Dave is sitting over here. Mark is, you can't see him in the ceiling, and John is hidden behind the curtains. So what I'm talking about today is joint work. I don't have... Is that good? <laughs> I hope this doesn't go off in a few minutes. So this is joint work with Sanji Chatterjee, Neil Koblitz, and Paula Sarkar. Just to set the framework. This is a talk about provable security. So the goal of provable security, as most of you know, is to prove that a protocol P is secure with respect to some computational problem or primitive S. And this process usually has three steps to it. There is the requirement of a security definition, which accurately captures the goals of the adversary and its capabilities. There is a statement about the assumptions of the hard problem or the primitive. And there's a reduction of security proof which uses a hypothetical adversary of the protocol. I call this adversary A to construct a algorithm that breaks the hard problem uh, P. So this is going to go off every few seconds, it looks like. I don't know why. But anyway, so having done such a proof, the question one should always ask is, what practical assurances of security does the proof provide when you deploy the protocol in practice? This is both a very important question and also a very difficult question. And today I want to talk about three difficulties with interpreting proofs in practice. I'll focus on tightness of proofs, uh, the multi-user versus the single-user setting, and the non-uniform complexity model. And for concreteness, I'll focus on MAC schemes. OK, this talk is about what I, what, what's called practice-oriented provable security, understanding what practical problems, uh, practical protocols, uh, proofs for practical problems can meet in practice. I'm not talking about what people call the foundations of cryptography, where people study interesting theoretical constructions that achieve certain cryptographic goals. And these constructions may or may not be useful for the present. That's not the problem. So I'm not talking about what people typically call the foundations of cryptography. My talk is based on papers available on our website, nuddlelook.ca. These papers are viewed by many as being highly controversial. I'd like to share with you two quotes I received from uh, recent anonymous referee reports for one of our papers. So one referee said, these papers have elicited a wide variety of reactions from the cryptographic community, ranging from visceral hatred to adulation. Uh, another referee comment uh, com was commenting on our critique of this emerging field of leakage resilience, which the referee sees as being a field in its infancy. And the referee says, what one must wonder lies behind his desire to commit infanticide. Yep. So just for the record, our goal in writing these papers isn't to receive adulation, and it's certainly not to commit infanticide. So there's been rumors on the blogs, on Facebook and Twitter, which I'd like to dispel right now by disclaiming once and for all that no babies were killed <laughs> in preparation for this talk. <laughs> I actually should be a bit more precise. Uh, uh, so I arrived in Heathrow Airport Saturday evening, spent the night at the hotel preparing my slides and all day Sunday. And for dinner Saturday, I did have veal. So I guess in principle, a baby bull was killed in preparation for this talk. I feel terrible about that, and I really should try harder to be a vegetarian. Uh, but no human babies were killed in preparation for this talk. And in fact, I've never ever killed any human babies. <laughs> And I've checked with my co-authors, and they agree that it's, it's, just, it's wrong to kill human babies. So don't ever do it. Okay? And I guess to be totally clear, uh, it's also wrong to kill human children and human adults. Okay? And I was happy to see this proven last night at the rum session by Alex Dent. A simple corollary of his talk was that it's wrong to kill human babies, human children, and human adults. So I'd like to see that proven formally last night at the rum session. But if you notice carefully, there was a little gap in his proof. It didn't really account for teenagers. Okay? <laughs> so if you happen to have a human teenager between the age of 12 and 25 that really annoys you, you think carefully about it, 
and you really want to kill that teenager, that's probably all right. Okay? <laughs> but other than that, killing babies, children, or adults of the human kind is certainly wrong. OK, so the first part of my talk will be analyzing tightness. OK, this is an area that's well known to everyone who works in protocols, but and a lot of work is done in trying to address it. But for the most part, I find the issue is sort of swept under the rug. Let me tell you what I mean by tightness. So again, we, have, uh, we want to prove a protocol secure with respect to a primitive or problem S. So we assume there's an algorithm A, which breaks a protocol. I'll assume that A, T epsilon breaks the protocol, which means in running time T, the algorithm is successful with probability at least epsilon. So the reduction then is an algorithm R, which uses uh, A as a subroutine to, uh, and, and solves the problem S. So we'll suppose the reduction algorithm R solves a problem in time T primed uh, with probability of success at least epsilon primed. So what this theorem then tells you is that if the primitive is T primed, epsilon primed secure, then the protocol is T epsilon secure. That's what the security proofs gives you. The proof is set to be tight. If T primed and T are approximately equal to each other, as are epsilon primed and epsilon. And tight proofs are desirable because then the assumptions you make about the well-studied primitive or hard problem are directly translated into the assurances for the protocol. The proof gives you a very nice assurance from your assumptions about the hard problem. The proof is non-tight, on the other hand, if T is a lot less than T primed, or if epsilon is a lot greater than epsilon primed. And non-tight proofs are less desirable because then you don't get the same assurance from, for the protocol as you assume for the hard problem. So the tightness gap I'll call the ratio of the time success probability uh, for, the, uh, for, the, um, for, for the hard problem and for the protocol you get from the proof. So as an example, where we mostly know this classic now proof by Blory and Rogaway for full domain hash RSA. Um, the proof is non-tight, the tightness gap being equal to the number of queries uh, that the adversary makes to the random oracle. This can, in general, be quite large. So uh, for concreteness, let's suppose n is an RSA modulus of length 1,024 bits. The assumption we can make about the hard problem is that the RSA problem can't be uh, solved for these parameters of t prime and epsilon prime. This we get from the number field set. OK, so suppose that's a forger, t epsilon forger of the RSA full demand full domain hash scheme makes it most 2 to the 60 hash queries, then the blori uragway proof uses this algorithm to t epsilon over 260 solve the RSA problem. Okay, so the conclusion you get from this proof is that if that RSA full domain hash is t epsilon secure for t divided by epsilon at most 2 to the power 20. Again, under the assumption stated here. So there's a tightness gap in this proof of 2 to the power 60. The result being, if you use a 1,000-bit RSA modulus, the assurance from the proof is really a lot less than you would like in practice. A million is not a very large uh, security assurance. Well, if, of course, if you want the assurance of 2 to the 80, you can increase your RSA modulus. In this case, increase n to be a 4,000-bit RSA modulus, and then you get the light, desired level of assurance from the proof, except if now, you, now, you now incur a performance hit because the modulus is a lot larger. Okay. But, but in practice, no one takes these recommendations seriously. So I don't know of a single standardized protocol supported by non-tight proof where the parameters were increased because the proof was non-tight. I also don't know of a single implementation of any protocol where the parameters were increased because the supporting proof for that protocol was non-tight. Okay. Also, if your primitive happens to be, say, AES, which you have in hardware, and you have a non-tight proof that assumes AES is a pseudo-random function, you can't increase the parameters of ES in any easy way to account for the non-tightness in proofs. If your protocol is a pairing-based protocol and you want to use it at the 128-bit level for which BN curves are ideally suited and your proof is a very non-tight proof, you can't increase the parameters of the BN curve. You need a curve with the right embedding degree. These things may not even exist. So you, you have a really big penalty performance if you really want to increase parameters for a pairing-based protocol to account for non-tightness in a security proof. So in the literature, you know, most proofs are non-tight, and there's no common way of dealing with the, with the non-tightness. Here's one example I found from a survey paper by Boyan on ID-based encryption. So Boyan compares the tightness of the reductions for the Bonnet-Franklin 
Sakai Kasahara and the Bonet Boyend ID based encryption schemes. So he notices that the reduction for BB1 is significantly tighter than the reduction for Bonet Franklin, which in turn is significantly tighter than the reduction for Sakai Kasahara. But in fact, all three reductions are highly non tight. Uh, the reductions having tightness gaps equal to the uh, being linear, quadratic, and cubic in the number of random oracle queries. So, so, so really, SK has a highly, highly, highly non tight reduction. Uh, BF is highly, highly non tight, while BF, BB1 is highly non tight. Okay, nonetheless, Boyan's recommendations are that SK should generally be avoided as a rule of thumb. When A. Franklin is safe to use, and BB1 appears to be the smartest choice, in part due to the fairly efficient security reduction of the latter. And this is logical advice, as long as you actually take the advice. So if you look at a recent ITF standard co-authored by Bo Yen for BB1 and BF1, uh, the parameters chosen for the standard are chosen without regards to the non-tightness of the proof. So they're using the proof as assurance as if the proof were tight, when in fact it's highly non-tight. Okay, so there is no uniform way of dealing with non-tight proofs. So suppose you have a, your own protocol, you have a proof for it, it's non-tight. Yeah, does tightness really matter, is the question. And there are many ways of thinking about this. So on the one hand, you could be optimistic and assume that in the future, someone will find a tighter reduction for your protocol. And in the case of RSA full domain hash, Koran shortly after found a much tighter proof for RSA full domain hash, where the tightness gap was the number of signature queries, not the number of ha random oracle queries. So that's a possibility. So perhaps a tight reduction can't be found for the protocol, but if you modify the protocol every slightly, you do get a tight reduction. And Katz and Wang have a nice little modification of RSA full domain hash. Uh, if you make the small modification, you get a tight reduction. And so you can either, either then make that modification in practice or use the modification as a rationale that the original RSA full domain hash is secure and doesn't need the modification. The modification buys you tightness. It doesn't really seem to buy you any security in practice. So we can maybe ignore this non-tightness in the security proof. Uh, maybe you can get a tighter reduction by modifying or relaxing the hard problem. The first talk after lunch will do this for us, full domain hash. Uh, maybe the notion of security is too tight. You don't need adaptive, chosen, whatever. Make the security notion tighter, uh, looser, and then you get a um, tighter reduction. Maybe the protocol is secure, even though a tight reduction just doesn't exist. It's just the limitations of what reductions can achieve. Okay, and another optimistic conclusion is that a tight reduction is better than nothing at all. If you have no proof at all, some would say you have no assurance whatsoever that your protocol is secure. So let's just accept a highly non-tight reduction as being some assurance. So these are the optimistic uh, interpretations of non-tight proofs generally stated in papers. Almost no one talks about the nightmare scenario. Okay, namely, perhaps a protocol is in fact insecure, but an attack has not yet been discovered. Okay, and certainly as cryptographers, the nature of your work is necessarily conservative and hopefully somewhat paranoid. So you design your nice protocol, you try hard to prove it's secure, you work very hard at that, your proof is non-tight, you try hard to get a tighter proof and you fail. So I think your conservative and paranoid nature must lead you to conclude that I can't make this proof tighter because there exists an attack which I haven't found as yet. That to me is the most logical conclusion to be made for a non-type proof if you are a conservative and paranoid cryptographer. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, we'll talk about Mac schemes. So HK here is a family of Mac functions indexed by an R bit key K. So the usual security notion of Mac schemes involves a secret key K, uh, an adversary B who's given access to a Macing oracle, and the attacker's goal is to compute a message tag pair that's valid where the message wasn't previously queried to the oracle. So I'll call this problem the problem of breaking Mac 1. OK, now this definition involves one user, or a pair of users, and an attacker. But in the real world, we always deploy Mac schemes in the multi-user setting, where there are many users, potentially millions of users. So really, we want to study the security of Mac schemes in the multi-user setting. So I have a, a, a definition for that. I'm calling it Mac star. So we're using now the same Mac scheme in the multi-user setting. There are n users, or n pairs of users, each having a secret key, k sub i. The adversary has access to or Macing oracles for each of these users, and the attacker's task is to compute the message tag pair 
for some specified user of the end users. That's the Mac forgery. I'll call this problem uh, the task of breaking Mac star. OK, so Mac, uh, Mac schemes secure with respect to the first definition have been well studied. So now I want the assurance that the same Mac scheme when deployed in the multi-user setting is also secure. I want a security proof. And here's a nice elegant proof for the security of Mac star. It's a reduction from breaking Mac 1 to breaking Mac star. So I assume I have an algorithm A that T epsilon breaks Mac star, Mac in the multi-user setting. And I want to use A to uh, break the ordinary Mac problem. So I'm given an oracle for a macking function. And my goal is to use the algorithm A to produce a forgery for this macking oracle. The proof is uh, uh, of the kind used in very many proofs. So it's a very easy short proof. I'll start by selecting a random index j between 1 and n. For each other index i, I'll select my own secret key to represent user i's secret key, while user j's secret key is assigned to be the unknown secret key uh, for the given mapping oracle. So I run the adversary a. It makes queries to these different oracles. Of course, I can use the keys I chose to answer A's Mac queries to users other than the jth user. And I'll use the given oracle to me, HK, to answer A's oracle queries to user J. Okay, at the end of this experiment, A eventually outputs a message tag forgery with probably at least epsilon. And hopefully, this is for the jth user, which is with a further probability 1 over n. And if that's the case, I've used A to construct a forgery for the oracle that was given to me. OK, so my success probability here is epsilon divided by n. n because uh, I'm hoping that the attacker selects the jth user on which to produce the forgery. So to summarize, what this argument shows is that if Mac 1 is t primed epsilon prime secure, then Mac star is t primed n epsilon prime secure. So there's a tightness gap in this proof equal to n. OK, does this tightness gap matter? Yes, it does. So here's a simple attack on Mac star due to, I think, Eli, Eli Meehan for the first time we needed key collision attacks. So I'll assume here that the key length is less than the tag length for simplicity. The attack is very simple. Select an arbitrary message M and obtain tags for that single message M from the N users. Now select an arbitrary subset W of keys of size W. And for each key L in the size, Compute the MAC tag of that message with your choice of key, and compare it to the uh, tags you obtain from the end users. If you have a match, you conclude that L equals KI. So you found the ith user's key, and you use KI to forge a message tag pair for I. Okay, so the analysis is easy, but for specific examples, if you use CMAC, which is a provably secure and standardized MAC scheme with 80 bit keys and 80 bit tags, Assume there are a million users or pairs of users. Uh, choose W to be 2 to the 60. The attack takes 2 to the 60 steps, and with probably at least a half, it will recover one of the million users' secret keys. And in that sense, break the MAC scheme in the multi-user setting. There's also a very simple time memory trade-off, where with an offline computation of 2 to the 60 MAC computations, the online part of the attack takes only 2 to the 40 steps. Okay, so the speed up in this attack, over the generic attack of finding keys for a Mac scheme, is by a factor of n, which is precisely the tightness gap in the security reduction. Okay, so this is really the nightmare scenario where the tightness gap in the reduction translated exactly into a practical attack. Okay, how can this be fixed? Well, you might consider using what I call fixed Mac or F Mac. Very simple idea. Uh, before macking a message M, uh, the user always prefixes the message with a string F. This is a string that's fixed, non-secret, and unique uh, for every pair of users for that session. That's fixed mac, F mac. You can now check that F mac star, that's F mac in the multi-user setting, resists the previous attack. There's also a simple type reduction from mac star to F mac star. So F max star certainly doesn't reduce the security of max star. OK, and you can prove F max secure, F max star secure again uh, under the Mac 1 assumption. But like with my proof for max star, the proof for F max star is also non-tight. So the tightness gap is still M. 
Okay, so we have a scheme, a modified version of MaxStar, which is apparently more secure than MaxStar. It resists the attack I showed you in the previous slide. But the security reduction still doesn't take away the tightness gap of N. Okay, so, but in practice, of course, we would expect F max star to be uh, tightly related to the security of Mac 1 in practice. And that's roughly because if you look at the macking uh, functions, since each user has a different prefix for each message, I can imagine that each user has an independent family of Mac functions. And so the functions shouldn't have to interfere with each other. Okay, so interestingly enough, from a provably secure point of view, there's no difference between max star and f max star. Yet in practice, there is a big difference between the practical security of max star and f max star. Okay, so this, um, uh, this, this element of max star appears in several other protocols I found in the literature, this tightness gap as a result of the proof for max star. So I found this in the katz lindell aggregate max scheme. There's a history-free aggregate max scheme due to Ike Mir and co-authors, and also in the Kennedy Krawcheck authentication protocol from 2001. Again, these proofs are sometimes very complicated. A small element of these proofs includes precisely the proof I showed you for MaxStar. So these proofs inherit that tightness gap and also the attack. So this, is, the, the, this, this gap appears in several published proofs. So I think to conclude, non-tight proofs can give one a false sense of security. The literature has literally thousands of papers with non-tight proofs. The examples I gave, the non-tightness is a very simple factor, namely the number of users. Many proofs have five to 10 parameters which have to be uh, analyzed to, 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 to recover the non-tightness in the proof. And it really isn't clear at all whether those param the non-tightness is important or not. So a very legitimate question to ask is whether security proofs with non-tight reductions have any practical value. Okay, so my second brief uh, point is about the multi-user setting, which has been sometimes ignored in the literature. There's been quite a bit of work, though, um, on analyzing protocols in the multi-user setting. Perhaps the first was the Blory Ragway work on key establishment, where you can have a whole number of users talking to each other. There's been work done, by, I think, first by Blory, Boldy, Reva, and Macaulay on public key encryption in the multi-user setting, and some work by, uh, on, on signature schemes in the multi-user setting. Nonetheless, I think my previous topic uh, has argued effectively that the security definition for MAC schemes in the single-user setting is inadequate for the multi-user setting. Okay. One could argue that the MAC scheme definition is meant to be for security of a primitive. So you might treat MAC as a primitive, not really ready to be deployed in practice. You know, but I really think that when you define a scheme, a MAC scheme secure, it really should be sufficient uh, for the very basic application of a MAC scheme, namely authenticating messages. So I would argue that the basic notion of MAC scheme should be for a protocol, not for a primitive. And in that sense, the MAC1 definition is deficient. Okay, you can similarly argue that the classic goldwasser macaulay Revest definition for security of signature schemes is also deficient. And this is a well-understood and accepted definition. You have a user, Alice, who has a signing key, and you have a forger who can access Alice as a signing oracle. And the goal of the attacker is existential forgery against a tap the chosen message attack. But then when you actually use a signature scheme in practice, you're using it in the multi-user setting. Okay, we have many users with many public keys. You have a CA, you have all kinds of things. And it isn't at all intuitive as to what security notions you want from the signature scheme in the multi-user setting. And that's because signature schemes, digital signature schemes, are really quite different from handwritten signature schemes. So there is no a priori intuition as to what requirements you would desire the signature scheme to have in the multi-user setting. So I think a lot more work needs to be done on understanding what the correct definition is for signature schemes in the multi-user setting. I think it's a very fruitful and useful uh, question to think about. And sometimes people have defined things in the multi-user setting, but the definitions have been inadequate. So for instance, as the Binet, Gentry, Lin, Shockham definition for aggregate signature schemes, which is naturally in the multi-user setting, but the definition is deficient because the attacker is not allowed to adaptively select its target user. It's given a target user and asked to attack it, while in practice, the attacker might, while doing his computations, choose the attacker to attack on the fly. If you add this element to the definition, then your proofs lose tightness by the number of users. 
And whether that tightness gap is important or not, I don't know. I have no time to look at that. Okay, so I've also found many schemes which were proven secure in the single user setting and sometimes standardized. But if you use these schemes without modification in the multi-user setting, as you really will, then the similar attacks do apply as the one on MacStar. So, for example, the Rogway Shrimpton Deterministic Authenticated Encryption Scheme, the OCB Authenticated Encryption Scheme, the EME Disencryption Scheme. Uh, a nice paper by Greg Zavarucha from last month show that many standardized hybrid encryption schemes fall to the attack. And that's because the DEM part of the schemes are allowed to be deterministic, because the security notion for them is, 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 is weaker than if you were using encryption as you normally would. And that allows the attacks I mentioned before to be launched on these standardized encryption schemes. And also Krachuk's extract then expand key derivation scheme from crypto 2010 also falls to the same attack I described on MacStar. And that's because in practice, you would deploy these schemes in the multi-user setting, whereas the analysis and proofs are all in the single user setting. Okay, so the question I really uh, think I'm posing here is, should we be suspicious of security definitions and theorems that are in the single user setting, when in fact, these protocols are always deployed in the multi-user setting? Okay, my third point is about the non-uniform complexity model in cryptography. And the issue of non-uniformity versus uniformity is really just a semantic thing. The real issue is whether you can uh, use non-constructive arguments in practice-oriented provable security theorems and hope that the theorems are meaningful in practice. That's really the point of, the, uh, of, this, of this topic. Non-uniformity and uniformity is just semantics. I've chosen this language because people seem more comfortable with it. But it's, it's really not the main point of this topic. So I'll, I'll focus on HMAC and more precisely HMAC when MD5 is the underlying hash function. All right, so I'll let F be the MD5 compression function. H is the MD5 iterated hash function with IV uh, denoted here. So then the NMAC scheme proposed by Bellari, Kennedy, and Krachuk is, has two keys, and it maxes a message by first hashing the message with the second key serving as the IV. Uh, padding the resulting hash value to get a full message block, and then applying the compression function to the padded block with the first secret key. That's NMAC, uh, which was not desirable in practice because it has two keys, and also the keys appear as the IV. And so NMAC is modified to HMAC, which I want to describe because the main security argument for HMAC is really the one for NMAC. To go from NMAC to HMAC security is, is rather simple. So I'll focus in this talk on NMAC as defined here. Okay, so the Bellari kennedy krachuk proof of 96 uh, was a very elementary elegant proof. It had two assumptions, that the compression function is a secure MAC scheme, and that H is a collision-resistant hash function. The conclusion being that NMAC is a secure MAC scheme. However, of course, Professor Wang's collisions on MD5 and SHA-1 and 2005 meant that the proof was useless as a security guarantee for HMAC with MD5 or SHA-1. And to restore confidence then in the security of HMAC in practice, Bellari proposed a new proof in 2006 for NMAC uh, as a pseudo-random function. And the proof had the nice property that it only assumed that the compression function is a secure pseudo-random function. There's no longer any requirement for the hash function to be collision resistant. So here's Bellari's theorem from 2006, concisely stated, if the compression function is a secure PRF, then the MAC scheme is also a secure PRF. However, Bellari's proof is in the non-uniform complexity model. So this is a model of complexity where you can imagine a whole series of Boolean circuits, one for each input size, and one is only concerned with the existence of such circuits, not whether they can be officially constructed or not. Equivalently, you can view a uh, uh, non-uniform algorithm as being an ordinary Turing machine, a program, uh, which also has a set of advice strings, one string for each input size, and these strings only have to exist. We're not concerned with how these strings are actually found. So they might well be unconstructable, by which, by which I mean no one knows how to construct them efficiently. That's what a non-uniform algorithm is. So security proofs in the non-uniform model uh, have sometimes been uh, said to be very desired uh, because their conclusions are stronger than in the, in the uniform model. 
So I found a quote from an early paper by Shafi Goldwasser, who says, the most meaningful proofs of security are necessarily those proved with respect to the most powerful adversary. To this end, we should let the polynomial time adversary be not only probabilistic, but also non-uniform. Okay, so of course, it's desirable to prove theorems where the conclusion here is as strong as possible. So namely, security even against non-uniform adversaries. The problem, though, is that when your conclusion is in a non-uniform model, so is your hypothesis. And when your hypothesis is in a non-uniform model, on the one hand, it might be very hard to analyze. And secondly, it actually might be a lot easier to break the primitive in a non-uniform model than it is in the uniform model. So in fact, generally, uh, theorems in the non-uniform model are less desirable because, as I said, it's difficult to assess the hypothesis in the non-uniform model. And typically, the hypotheses are a lot stronger in the non-uniform model than they would be in the uniform model. And of course, we saw really nice examples of this at the RUM session talk by Bernstein and Longa last night. OK, so back to the PRF assumption in Bellari's theorem. The usual assumption is that a compression function is t epsilon q secure. If adversaries with running time at most t, making it most q oracle queries, and having, have advantage at most epsilon of deciding whether an oracle O given to it is either a purely random oracle or one of those functions with a secret hidden key. This is the standard notion for PRF security. OK, for MD5, for example, the fastest attack that's known on breaking PRFness with respect to this definition is exhaustive key search. So given a few message function pairs, all you can really do is uh, pick a key and check to see whether the message uh, uh, function pairs given to you agree for your key. And so your running time is, uh, is t, and your advantage is t over 2 to the 128. So you, 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 you win if you, by chance, pick the right key when doing exhaustive key search. If you don't, you just guess whether the oracle is random or a actual function. And you can see then that the advantage of the attacker is t over 2 to the power of 128. So the time success probability advantage for exhaustive key search of MD5 is 2 to the power of 128. Okay. So when evaluating uh, the conditions under which Bolari's theorem uh, applies in practice, Bellari assumes that exhaustive key search, the one I described here, is in fact the fastest generic attack for breaking PRFness of F. Okay. But ever, in fact, there are certainly more effective and faster generic algorithms in the non-uniform model. So let me tell you one. So we'll assume that the compression function has good randomness properties, in the sense I'll make more clear in, in the next few lines. So for a compression function value x, I'll let u of x be a uh, function, uh, which, which outputs a fixed bit of x. So maybe the 19th bit, or the XOR of the first 16 bits, anything you want, it outputs a fixed bit. So for each message m in the message space, I'll let prob of m denote the probability that this bit is 1, the probability being assessed over all uh, secret keys k. And I'll let m star now be a message for which this probability is maximum. So I claim that the probability of m star is at least half plus 1 over 2 to the 64. And a simple argument for that is to fix the message. Uh, consider this function, which produces a bit, as the key varies, as defining a random walk, in the forward direction if the bit is a 1, and in the backwards direction if the bit is a 0. Okay, we know that the standard deviation for a random walk from the starting point is square root of the number of steps. So you expect there to be a lot of random walks, which end up 2 to the 64 steps away from the starting point, either on the left or the right. You expect there to be one on the right. Pick such an M star. And its probability is at least half plus 1 over 2 to the 64. So such an M star certainly would exist for any naturally constructed uh, family of compression functions. Now you have the algorithm for breaking PRF to sub F. Query M star to the oracle. If the oracle response has a bit 1, then you guess that the oracle must be a compression function. Otherwise, you guess that the oracle is random. The running time of this attack is 1. You make only one query, and its advantage is at least 1 over 2 to the 64. So the time success probability ratio for this non-uniform attack on pre-RFness is 
2 to the 64 versus 2 to the 128 for exhaustive key search. Okay? And, and this is a massive difference when you're concerned with practice-oriented provable security. It's really a very massive difference. All right, so let's interpret Blory's proof in practice. Let's suppose messages are a million blocks in length for concreteness. So under the assumption that the fastest attack known on breaking PRFness of F is exhaustive key search, Blory argues that its proof justifies NMAC MD5 security up to 2 to the 44 queries, and similarly 2 to the 60 queries for NMAC with SHA-1. Okay. But in fact, as I noticed, there are faster attacks that likely exist on pseudorandomness in the non-uniform model. And if you take these attacks, uh, which you must because Blory's proof is highly non-constructible because it uses this idea of coin fixing to reduce the running time of the attacker in the proof, thereby drastically reducing the tightness gap in the proof. So if you take the adversary of PRF as I described earlier, then in fact we see that Blory's proof says nothing about NMAC MD5 security for greater than two to the 22 queries, as opposed to the claimed two to the 44 queries. Similarly, Blory's proof says nothing about NMAC SHA-1 security if the number of queries made by the attacker is 2 to the 30 or more compared to the claimed 2 to the 60. And again, this is a massive difference from the point of view of practice-oriented provable security. Okay, so you might ask the question now, is HMAC MD5 actually provably secure? Um, so in our paper, we do give an improved, a tighter proof than the one Bellari gave in the process of solving an open problem that he claimed was interesting. Uh, so we get a tighter proof. And our proof justifies NMAC MD5 security up to 2 to the 54 queries, and NMAC SHA-1 security up to 2 to the 70 queries. And this is essentially optimal in light of known birthday attacks on, on, these, on these MAC schemes. So we've almost proven HMAC MD5 secure. However, our proof has a large tightness gap, namely 1 equal to 9N squared. And since n can be fairly large in practice, 2 to the 20, 2 to the 30, this is a very large tightness gap between the security of the pseudorandom function and the pseudorandomness of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the MAC scheme. Also, our proof is in the single user setting, which is deficient. And even though pseudorandomness of, of the compression function is plausible and well-accepted definition, it's still a very strong uh, hypothesis in light of collision-finding attacks on MD5 and SHA-1. So our opinion is that the value of our proof uh, as a source of assurance about the real-world security of HMAC with MB5 or SHA-1 is questionable at best. A little postscript. Uh, Bernstein observed in 2005 that NMAC and HMAC have really straightforward security proofs if you're willing to assume that F is a pseudorandom function and that the hash function is almost universal. I want to find that notion here, but if you believe that H hash functions are almost universal hash functions, then most of the discussion is, is completely moot. Okay, so this is a nice question to think about. Are MD5 and SHA-1 almost universal hash functions? So I found this questionable use of the non-uniform model in several other papers. They were all used, again, to uh, obtain tighter security proofs by going from the uniform model to the non-uniform model. So that I found one in the multi-property preserving hash domain extension paper of Bellari and Riston part. There's a sandwich hash max scheme of Yasuda, a paper in Asia Crypt by Yasuda on boosting Merkle Damgard hashing for max, and a leakage resilient stream ciphers from pseudorandom bit generators. All these papers switched to the non uniform model to get tighter reductions in their proofs, except their hypotheses now are also in the non uniform model. So therefore, they're much stronger, and it isn't clear at all what's been gained by moving to the non uniform model, if anything at all. So the question I want to leave you with is, uh, should unconstructible security theorem proofs in the non-uniform model be totally rejected? Okay, so I would like to make some concluding remarks. So what's the significance of our work to cryptography? So I think if you're a theoretician right, who works in the foundations of cryptography and you, you work as having maybe long-term applications, but you don't care about applications in the near, in the, in the near, near term, our results are totally irrelevant to you, right? Because typically the non-tightness in proofs, the tightness gaps arise from factors that are polynomial in the security parameters. So asymptotically, they mean nothing at all. The number of users in the scheme is typically polynomial in the security parameters, so 
whether you're in the single or multi-user setting shouldn't really make a big difference. And of course, a non-uniform complexity model is a perfectly valid model in complexity theory. So if you work in foundations and you don't care about practice, our results should mean nothing to you. If you're a practitioner who uses security proofs as a tool, as one tool, to assess whether your scheme is secure or not, but you rely more heavily on extensive cryptanalysis and sound engineering principles, and you really shouldn't be alarmed by any of our observations. At best, and I hope you at least treat our work as light entertainment, and that should be it. Okay? However, if you happen to be a cryptographer who believes that a security proof is essential and perhaps the only way to gain confidence in the practical security of a protocol, then you really should be much more concerned by our observations. In fact, I claim you should be very skeptical of non-tight proofs, proofs in the single user setting, and proofs in the non-uniform complexity model, and perhaps even totally reject these proofs as just mere heuristic arguments for the security of your protocol. OK, so I think in conclusion, there's a lot of interesting, useful, relevant work to be done in understanding what security proofs really give you in practice. I'm proposing this interesting field of COPS, uh, which I think will be a very fruitful field, as it has been for us. You know, some of the questions that uh, arose from the lecture today is, I'll repeat them, is a non-tight proof of any value in practice? Should one be suspicious of security definitions that are in the single user setting? Should unconstructable security proofs in the non-uniform model be rejected completely? Are HMAC MD5 and HMAC SHA-1 prove to be secure in any reasonable sense? And these questions, I think, are all more relevant to practice that concerns a lot of people have about the random oracle assumption in security proofs. OK, so um, experience we had with our HMAC paper we submitted to ePrint in, in February, where we claimed that Bellari's proof, because it used a non-constructible argument, was flawed. We explained by flaw we meant that it resulted in a proof where the hypothesis couldn't be tested. And I was very surprised by the reaction from people, we got, uh, whether by email and blogs. Their main concern was that the proof is mathematically correct, that we were wrong to imply that it's wrong by saying it's flawed. The main point was the proof is mathematically correct. So I mean, the main goal of practice-oriented proof of security really should be about obtaining concrete security assurances, not just mathematical formalism and correctness. So it really bothered me that no one seemed concerned about the fact that Bellari's proof, in fact, uh, offered a lot more assurance in practice for HMAC than it had claimed. They were more concerned with the fact that the proof is mathematically correct and that all of that seems to matter. So I, I hope to leave you with the thought that it's more important to think to obtain concrete security assurances than, than simple mathematical correctness and formalism. And this reminds me of a nice quote from a paper of 2002 from Crypto by Poncheval, uh, Stone, Poncheval, Maloney, and Smart. They were talking about the error found in the original proof for OAP. And they said the use of provable security in is more subtle than it appears. And flaws in security proofs themselves might have a devastating effect on the trustworthiness of cryptography. And they emphasized by flaws, we do not mean plain mathematical errors, but rather ambiguities or misconceptions in the security model. So I think that comment is equally valid today as it was 10 years ago. Okay, so I think people were expecting a very highly controversial talk from me. Uh, they might be disappointed. So if you allow me one slide where I can be a little radical. Um, so the first point is addressing you know, what, I, uh, what I sense is a bit of a crisis of quality control in papers and crypto conferences. So I think an avenue for positive change is to ensure that security proofs start to get the detailed peer review they need and deserve. That can be done by insisting that proofs not be in the appendices of submitted papers, and referees should be required to read these proofs when they referee papers. And to me, it's really astounding that proofs are viewed as being really important in cryptography, but they're always placed in the appendices. Committee members of conferences don't have to read them. They typically don't, because they don't have the time, and I understand that. They're not, they don't appear in the, in the final versions of proceedings, and they're sometimes never, ever refereed. Full papers should be published, not extended abstracts, and there shouldn't be any page limits on published papers. If Springer complains about that, scrap Springer. We can stick with online 
on publications, I think. So paper shouldn't be an issue anymore. And I would really like to also uh, lobby for a better balance of the programs of major conferences. So I think the cross-pollination of ideas is really, really essential, especially this time, uh, this point in time in our field. Consider merging PKC Chess FSC with Crypto Eurocrypt Asia Group in some way. There may be too many talks. No problem. Let's switch to parallel sessions. It's better having people in the same uh, uh, same building than in conferences around the world. Better chance they'll actually talk to each other. Okay, my last remark to summarize. So while mathematical proofs certainly have their place in cryptography, I think our work illustrates some limitations of such proofs and highlights the important role that old-fashioned cryptanalysis and sound engineering practices continue to play in establishing and maintaining confidence in the security of a cryptographic system. Thank you. Thank you for our friend. Do you have uh, any question? Hello. So uh, what about TCC? I see you left TCC out of your merging proposal. <laughs> well, so, so the invitation asked me to speak about this work, so I think I was, I was forced to speak about this. One thing that was uh, actually underlying the talk, as I heard it, but I want to bring it more to the uh, forefront, um, proofs of security is really one of the best, if not the best, way that we have to distinguish uh, things that are secure from things that are not. Uh, so I hope this uh, demonstration of shortcomings in published paper doesn't, don't leave people wanting to abandon proofs. The issue is use proofs. I mean, HMAC is probably the prime example I want you probably the only example that we have in cryptography of a mode of operation that remained 2 to the 54 secure and the underlying product uh, primitive that it uses is utterly broken. And it's probably because it was designed with the ability to prove security in mind. Sure. So, so we, oh, I hope it's clear. Proofs will always play a role in cryptography. There's no danger in the future of people abandoning proofs. There's a lot of people doing proofs. I don't expect them to stop doing proofs overnight. So. Proofs will always be around, it'll always be fruitful, but there's more, a lot more work to be done in understanding what these proofs actually mean in practice. Was there a question? Yeah, yeah. A proposal about papers being 30 pages or more being switched to the journal. That's for the ICA board to sort out. I really haven't been engaged in those discussions. I just think, you know, at some point, we shouldn't worry about the length of a paper. If the proofs are that important, we should be able to read them and have referees read them and insist that referees review them. Was there, was there a question? No? Yes. No, certainly no, but it's just the, uh, so the question was, you know, I had the assumed security of RSA as being 2 to the 80 in terms of a time divided by success probability ratio. So, so really, what I'm, the, the evidence we have is that if you have running time 2 to the 80, then you can break RSA with probability 1. Yes, but there is no nice trade-off between T and epsilon that I know of. So the only real uh, parameter I see in papers is T of epsilon being in most 2 to the 80. That's the best I have to work with. And it certainly would be a lot more interesting to understand what that real ratio should be when you make assumptions about the hardness of RSA. Yes. So 
You said we do non uniform to gain efficiency or something. That's not the reason. The reason is we simply have no clue how to do it uniformly. We don't have like non uniform dense model theorems and so on to do this leakage resilient crypto things uniformly. It's but, open. But I was quite sure in your paper you did mention that you did have a proof for your protocol in the uniform model. We, we, s we, said, we said, no, no, no. We said that there are uniform proofs of the dense model theorem, and using yes. this, there might be chances to get the entire proof uniform, but there are still lots of things that we don't know how to do. So sure, OK. It's okay. not, not sure. an efficiency issue. Sure. It's, it's open. But yeah, but your paper did they'll say that you prefer the non-uniform model because you get a tighter reduction. Oh, the, the dense model theorem is extremely non-tight uh, yes. if it's uniform, yes. Yeah. And but the thing the is, is, so the conclusion is uh, you get a tighter reduction, but your hypothesis now okay. is necessarily stronger because you can break pseudorandom bit generators a lot faster in the non-uniform model than in the uniform model. My, my little attack on pseudorandomness applies equally well to pseudorandom bit generators. Yeah. No more questions? So I think people got the question, and the answer is we don't know. That's why we need to rely on good old-fashioned cryptanalysis uh, to establish the confidence in the system and also maintain it over the time. Because proofs can't tell you in the end whether the random oracle model is a stronger assumption than assuming some new, complicated, interactive decision definitely on assumption on pairings. It's really something we need to gain over time by constant study by doing good old-fashioned cryptanalysis. Proofs will not give you that assurance. So there is no easy answer. Crypt analysts will be in business for a long time. OK, so I think it will be time for the lunch. And so let us thank Alfred again.